Hello. Um, so I, I see that you guys laugh, so forgive me if I every once in a while make a joke that it's intentional. Um, but let's start off by saying we are going to have a quantum computer. And whether that's in the next five years or never or in the next 20 years, everybody is busy with it. And there's a logical reason why they're all busy with it. It's because we all know Moore's Law. Does everybody know Moore's Law still? Yeah? Okay. Does anybody not know Moore's Law? Don't be shy. <laughs> Uncomfortable laughter is always a sign that someone doesn't know Moore's Law, by the way. So, um, what is Moore's Law? I saw you guys shaking your head. You know what it is? So the uh, computing power doubles every 18 months. Yeah, so the computing power doubles every 18 months. And actually, by doing so, the cost of the computing power that you then derive it also gets cheaper. So there's an asymmetric relationship between the power you get back and the cost that you're, that you're investing in to get it. Um, but here's the problem with Moore's Law. At a venture point, you can keep adding processors, and you keep thinking you're going to derive the necessary computing power from it, but you don't. So Moore's Law begins to peter off. Instead of having this exponential rise, it actually starts, eh, not increasing so much. And as a result of which, that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing Amdahl's law in effect, that you can keep adding this processing power, but you're not getting the relevant results back. So as a result of which, we have no other choice than to explore a different type of topology, which is afforded to us by developing a quantum computer. And so that I can disabuse any notions of what you're going to use it for, you're not going to use a quantum computer to, you know, work on at home, you know, to that the kids go, everybody gets a quantum computer, right, Dad? That's not going to happen. So really, a quantum computer is there to solve some very specific scientific problems, really, and large data set problems, which our current topology has difficulty with. We're looking for that needle in the haystack. So that means, as a result of which, like where it's ideal for are fundamental questions in science. One of the biggest things that we talk about here is, for example, protein mapping or protein folding in interactions. And the reason that you want to know and understand that is because you want to understand the impact of drugs and treatment on an individual. So if we ever want to get to a place where we have a cure for different types of cancer, we're going to need a quantum computer to help get us there. Because right now, the type of topology that we have at our disposal, even with the biggest supercomputers on Earth, and the next one that's going to be built for another $500 million, is not going to help us get there without some element of quantum with it. Are we clear? Okay. So this is definitely going to happen. Let's start on that premise. Because there are good reasons why it should happen. And what you see is that race to get there. It really is a race. Google, Microsoft, IBM, every single university worth their salt, countries, underground labs, they are all working on this. And they're working on this in order to prove something as well. It's called quantum supremacy. They want to prove that a quantum computer with a certain amount of qubits will be better than any classical computer that we currently have access to. And what Google recently announced is that, you know, it was actually, um, uh, was it, we're now in May, so it was early last year, they announced Bristlecone. They wanted to initially achieve this quantum supremacy within a year, but it's already been nearly two years that they've announced that, and they haven't gotten there yet. But what Google estimated is that they could actually prove this quantum supremacy when they had 49 qubits and a circuit depth exceeding 40, yeah? And with a low error rate, because otherwise the thing doesn't keep working. Um, and they had bristlecone, and bristlecone didn't have 49 qubits, but 72. So they had a 72 qubit processor. It's not just a fundamental physics challenge to get some of this working. It also is a really significant engineering challenge. And although that race is on, there's no clear line about who's closer to the finish. Everyone is trying different things, and some of the things that are being tried are happening in secret. So not all of the information about the advancements are necessarily known by the entire academic or even uh, business community. So let's 
go back a bit because I'm already talking about circuit depth, et cetera. I might be confusing you and qubits. What is that? So everybody knows what binary is, right? We're in a computer security conference. Binary, we're good. What's, bi what's binary? Zeros and ones. And uh, the clue is we all understand that. If I would divide this room, binary means that one is zero, something is zero, and another one is one. That's it. There's no other option. Yes? A qubit, though, is what we use instead of a bit. In computing, we use qubits, which are not exactly binary because they have a much more free interpretation. So what they are is, if you would say that this is the one and this is the zero, there are a zero and a one at the same time. And it's like flipping a coin. You know, while you're flipping it, you don't know whether it's gonna land on heads or tails. You only know once it's landed. So once you've measured it, then you know whether it actually is a zero and a one. Is everyone still with me? Okay, is anyone not with me yet? Okay. So this is a fundamental principle, and the reason it's so fundamental is because everything we want to do later with this architecture is based on this building block which hasn't decided what it is. And while it's in the state of flux, has these alternative possibilities to write data to it. And let's talk about those alternative possibilities a moment because the issue is if you just have, in the space where you had a zero or a one, in your computing topology, now you have a zero and a one, that's pretty neat, because you've just increased your opportunity to write data by two to the n, right? So where, okay, so two to the n, so if I say two where n is one, how many is that? I'm sorry, I'm asking easy questions to get to the more complex stuff. So, thank you, all right, so, where I had one opportunity, where I had the zero or the one, I only had one thing, right? And now I have a qubit, so I have two to the n, and if we start with the position one, and I have two opportunities. If I now entangle my qubits, which means that I take one set of qubits, or one qubit, and I couple it with another qubit that's in the opposite direction. They basically, in essence, they, that's how you do entanglement when they can sort of meld with each other from these opposing positions, I now have two qubits. So that's two to the n, where n is now two qubits. So n is the number of qubits. How many do I have? Four. If I have three qubits entangled, if I have four qubits entangled, Okay, we get quiet. This is my point. We think it's so simple, but it's just two times two times two times two, which is? Two times two is? <laughs> times two is? Times two is? Times two is? Do you see where I'm going? It's no longer linear. It's exponential. Where you had in one space a zero or a one, if you have two to the four qubits, how many possibilities do you have? We were just there. <laughs> Come on. 16. There you go. Okay? So we are drastically increasing the amount of space to which we can write data. This is why a quantum computer is so fucking cool. <laughs> because we can do this. And th this is the whole opportunity area. We're only talking about four qubits. Imagine now that we get to 50. If we get to 50, we are faster than any supercomputer on Earth. That is really, really cool. That should be blowing your mind. 50 qubits, and there they are. Okay. Okay, again, a little easy. Does everybody remember what a prime number is? Come on, guys. It's after lunch. Someone has not had their coffee or cocaine or whatever you do in Norway. <laughs> so, okay, this is a prime number sieve where we're looking at all the prime numbers from 1 to 120. And every time a prime number gets hit, you see it being collected on uh, the right-hand side. So why am I showing you prime numbers? Because this is the fundament of every reason. Look, if a quantum computer can bring us all these cool, awesome things, it also brings us things that we need to worry about. And the biggest worry that I have as a computer science person, as an information security person, is the threat to our current cryptography. All of our current cryptography is based on multiplication of very large prime numbers. Okay, not little prime numbers, like the little baby ones that I'm showing you now, but really, really, really big primes. Okay, Gaussian mathematics. 
We all still with me? Yay, primes. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about why is it a threat. If we multiply stuff, if we multiply these large primes, we can also try to go back. Here's the deal. We find that difficult. We find it difficult to reverse this one-way function. So no cryptographer ever said, my cryptography is unbreakable. A good cryptographer just says, this is hard stuff. It takes you a while to try to figure out what you know, the key is if you have the ciphertext. It's hard stuff, it's hard math, but it's not impossible math. And that's why I, I want to point out, so we've got two difficult, not impossible, math problems that we base our current crypto on with these large primes. So we have integer factorization and discrete logs. If we talk about integer factorization, I know it's after lunch, I really, I feel you, okay? But if we talk about integer factorization, what we're talking about doing is reversing that one-way function. So let's pick like easy single-digit numbers. Um, nine times eight is one of my favorites. What's nine times eight? 72. 72. What are all the factors of 72? We're doing integer factorization now. I give you only 72 and I tell you, what are all the factors that could have led me to 72? Come on. And I'm waiting. <laughs> and this is kind of my point. Our current computers have the same problem. We know how to do nine times eight. We can do that, that's easy for us. That's also easy for our current computing architecture. But if we only give them the ciphertext, which would be the 72, to try to figure out, oh, how the hell did you get there? They find it hard too. You also hear from your computer a relative, uh, you know, so I'm just joking. They don't really make that noise. <laughs> Uh, if they do, take it back to the Apple Store. Uh, but the point is that you really have an issue trying to reverse this. So that's how we know when it's a hard math problem. Discrete log is also referred to as clock arithmetic, and it's the same thing. So here's a, a discrete log formula, 3 to the 16th, with a modulus, which means the remainder of 17. And we have a clock, not with 12 numbers, but with 17 numbers. So if we want to have a, a modulus of 17, and we go back, the answer then will be 1. Okay? And if we, again, if I only give you one and I try to ask you to figure out what this exponential value is, and modules, can you figure it out? It's hard, it's the same issue. So what we have in order to do it is to actually have two formulas. One was written by Peter Schur and another one was written by Grover, not this Grover, another Grover. Um, but basically they already had the formulas to do this, to reverse these difficult math problems before we ever had a quantum computing architecture to try those algorithms out on. And that's the point. So we have the algorithms we need. If we get a quantum computer, ba-bang, it's magic, broken crypto. Yeah? And now let's talk about what type of crypto. So the predominant worry that we have is, look, we know that if we have a certain amount of qubits, it takes very little time to break our current crypto. So if we, this is like basically looking at our RSA using Shor's algorithm. And you know, like NIST has a recommendation, that's the National Institute of T Standards and Technology, about how your key length size should be when you use this algorithm. And what we're saying is instead of taking like a billion years to figure this out, you are now gonna reduce the time to reverse this difficult math problem to a couple of seconds, provided you have enough qubits in your quantum computing architecture to do this. How many of you use encryption today? I should see all the hands up. Have you ever done e-banking? Do you have a website that you connect to? Do you share your genital pictures? I don't know. All those things usually use some form of cryptography in order to enable. I'm joking, I'm just trying to wake everyone up. So, um, but usually you're using some form of cryptography like persistently through your day. And my point is all of that comes at risk when we have this threat. And when you take a look at the actual impact, um, look, let's be clear here. So when we use symmetric keys, we are not saying it's completely broken because the biggest threat is to asymmetric cryptography. However, even when you use symmetric keys, there's a worry around the CHEMS, the key exchange mechanism. 
So even there, you need to make sure you're using larger key sizes. And for all of the rest, from SHA to RSA to elliptic curve to DSA, you know, we say like certain things are no longer secure and certain things we know we need to increase the entropy and increase the output. So it is a concern, and we should all be busy with trying to figure out how to do this now. The reason we should all be busy with this is because we haven't actually thought it through. We haven't actually tried to figure out how do we do appropriate data management when we have this threat. And in order to do that correctly, you need to figure out what's the power, potential, and threat of a quantum computer. So first and foremost, how long do you need to keep that encryption that you're using throughout your day secure? How long? Anybody? Anybody, how long? Guess. There's no wrong answer, just guess. How long do you need to keep your banking data secure? A week? A day? Just put it out there, it's all there anyway. <laughs> the Chinese got it, I mean, what? what? How, really, how long? Like, how long do you want to keep it? Has anyone ever done genetic testing? No one sequences their DNA in Norway? It's not like Iceland, where we all do. Now, OK. Uh, so if you've ever done any type of medical testing, and if you've ever submitted some of those results uh, to a testing facility or to your doctor, and they have to protect it, and they have to communicate with a hospital, et cetera, if you have a sort of e-health thing, then you have the question about, should that be secure for 10 years, 20 years, maybe a lifetime? If it's genetic data, then you're talking about not only your own lifetime, but also that of your progeny in order to protect them as well. We don't know how to do this. We don't know how to do this. And the reason is because how long does it take before there's a viable quantum computer that can actually compromise that cryptography? The, the quantum optimist, you know, the one who's like, it's already there in the NSA's basement, you know, they're real optimists. But like the more reasonable optimistic approach is about five to 10 years. If you talk about a quantum skeptic, they'll say it'll never be there, cold fusion will get there first before there's ever a quantum computer. But even with a reasonable skeptical approach, we're still saying about 20 to 25 years. So you have this kind of more realistic framework, five to 10 or 20 to 25, which are more reasonable outer parameters of when we're actually gonna have some form of quantum computing that's reasonable enough to break our crypto. And like really, if you know that that threat is that imminent between five to 25 years, then you have to ask yourself, how quickly can you get all of your quantum assets, your cryptographic stuff in view so that you can actually do something about it and transition? How many of you know all of the crypto you use all across your company network, your personal memes, et cetera? Or you're really tired or nobody feels like putting their hand up. Um, but the issue is how long, okay, how many of you have ever transitioned from IPv4 to IPv6? Okay, there I believe the hand's up, because here's the deal, we haven't done it. Not nationally, not globally, not anywhere. So if it takes us this long to go from IPv4 to IPv6 globally and protect everything there, we know that we're not gonna get ready with the quantum stuff in the same amount of time. And we've had an IPv6 standard for more than 20 years. So we know we are not good at moving quickly. It will take us a long time to transition. Therefore, we are already too late and we should have started now. The threat is, it's about the fact that every piece of information that we've ever transmitted, encrypted as well as unencrypted, has already been captured in some form. And, you know, there's a real picture here behind me of the Utah Data Center facility. This is a real collection facility that's used to monitor communications and store them. They actually take snapshots of the internet, if you will, and of all of the communications that's over the air, satellites, etc. So if you imagine that even though they may not have a quantum computer yet, the capture now and decrypt later problem is a real problem because there's a certain amount of predictive force of old secrets. Old secrets are sometimes just as good as new secrets. If they can tell you something about how an actor will behave, how long their key lengths are, size matters here, so this is a big deal. So, you know, I believe that with that key length issue, we actually have a phase plan of defense. We can already start taking care of our defenses now. 
in the absence of a lot of other things, the first and foremost thing we can do is increase the key length of the current crypto you use. This assumes that you know the current crypto you use and that you know the parameters like key length. Obviously. So you first you know, increase the key length. The second thing you do is look for opportunities where you can also use technology that's already there now. For example, you can today buy off the shelf technology that will provide you secure quantum communications with quantum key distribution. There is a limitation here, we'll discuss that in a moment, but you can already do that. And then what I believe is the most future forward uh, plan is to look at post quantum algorithms. And what that means is even when there is a quantum computer, you will still be safe because you'll be using a new set of algorithms that have a different degree of difficulty where even with a quantum computer, you can't break through them. We'll talk about why we're not all using those right now. So this is a little refresher course on quantum key distribution. Everybody remembers our best friend Alice, right? Alice wants to talk to Bob. In order to do that, she's going to use a quantum channel, which is basically a fiber optic link. And Eve, the eavesdropper, can't see it when she's using this quantum channel. And she'll transmit her key over a public classical authenticating channel, then transmit the key over the quantum channel, and she's good to go. Yeah? Let's take a look at what that really looks like. So what that really looks like here is Evil Eve with her little evilness stick. Um, and what Alice actually has in a quantum, distribution, quantum key distribution setup is she has a set of polarizers. Everybody have sunglasses that once were polarized? Yes, okay, after you scratch it 20 times, they you know, kind of suck, the polarization varies. But um, the point is, what Alice will have done to Bob is tell Bob how she set up her polarizers. She'll do this over a classical channel. So she'll be like, Bob, I set mine up like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a single photon emitter, which is my photon source, a single particle of light, and I'll transmit it through my polarizers. When Eve is not eavesdropping, because there's just no cloning principle, if she tries to look at it or observe it, she will alter it. So you can't copy the transmission, you can't observe the, the, the transmission without being noticed yourself. If Eve does this, there is a shift in the photon, and as a result, Bob gets gibberish. So even when Bob has his polarizer set up correctly, he will not get the communication from Alice if Eve is in between the link. It's a physical form of security. Are we all with me? Do we all understand this? Any questions so far? Okay, so if you look at this, there, you can, might already see the obvious limitations of this physical form of security because it's about the length of your fiber channel. So there's a problem here because really, you can't have a single piece of fiber go further than 64 kilometers. How many of you communicate with people that are more than 64 kilometers away? Okay, so the fiber, yeah, thank you for your hand raise. Very kind, <laughs> rhetorical question, but good, good, I like that. Um, so here's the deal. Uh, there's a researcher in Italy from the University of Padua, uh, Paolo Villarese, and what he did is he did an experiment in the Canary Islands, good place to do an experiment. Um, but he basically put up a big laser, an observatory between Las Palmas and Tenerife, and he shot this photon across the sea over a distance of 144 kilometers. And this is called free space quantum key distribution. So no more distance limitations because he's running it through free space. It's pretty neat actually. But what's even neater is what China did where China launched the world's first quantum communication satellite into low earth orbit, which is really cool, and a 2,000 long kilometer network from Beijing to Shanghai. Did I mention they are spending, not millions, billions on all things quantum for research, fundamental research as well as applied research. And not only them as a government, but also Alibaba has devoted 10 billion for uh, labs that study and explore both quantum computation as well as communication. Look, bottom line, if you guys tomorrow go into your basement, somehow magically uh, uh, deliver a quantum computer, that's fine but China will be impervious to your attack. And that's relevant. So they have their security in order and they have an active defense and they're also preparing their own offense. 
when you see that there's QKD being used for military portion, uh, operations, for also like, you know, critical infrastructure continuity, there are tons of projects. There are European projects, there are global projects, there's all over the place. Um, I would suggest that you take a look at these online. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but you do need to know that there's a lot of work happening in this area. What I find also really exciting, also about Orbit, is that Elon Musk is launching Starlink. It's a full constellation of satellites that'll be there to provide both uh, internet and mobile connectivity from low Earth orbit. This is going to be very cool, but there's also quantum and free space applications here. We, as KPN, have our own quantum projects, and um, I don't know if you guys have heard of PGP, pretty good privacy. The guy who wrote it is this dude. He's working in my team, which is already like a sort of parallel universe thought. But the guy who wrote PGP is in my team at KPN, and he is the head of our lab unit for security labs that's actually working on a post-quantum algorithmic uh, tools as well as a, a backbone for the country. So what we started with was a single link, so a single QKD link between The Hague and Rotterdam. And where we want to go to uh, by 2021 is a full quantum internet backbone in the country. These are humble ambitions compared to the Chinese. But what we want to do is actually in a way much cooler than the Chinese because we want to make these nodes not be reliant on only the fiber length. We want to make these nodes have a quantum repeater built in so you can lengthen the connections indefinitely. No more 64 kilometer problems. It's basically the blueprint for a new quantum internet. And that's why we're so keen on building it. When you take a look at the standardization around having the new algorithm set, which is the third recommendation I had, you know, you'll see that NIST is only going to be ready with their draft standards by 2024. I would urge you not to wait. Do not wait. Take a look at what we're doing on our post-quantum roadmap. We've already built a post-quantum VPN, WireGuard. We're going to submit it this summer. You can all download it. It's going to be open source available for the world. And this means that when you use a VPN for your communications traffic, no one else can intercept it. What we're working on as well, early stage with Tatulona, is a post-quantum version of SSH, but we're very early days in doing that. And we this year also want to build a post-quantum version of PGP. Security for everybody and encryption for all is kind of the way we look at it. Um, what I'd like to urge all of you to do is take that inventory of those crypto assets. There were like no hands up. So think it through for when you're going to be ready with your own implementation. Look for that crypto agility. Be able to swap out algorithms. We've already done it once with our VPN solution. We were originally invested in one set of algorithms. It didn't pass the next round of the NIST standards evaluation. We were able to, within a week, swap it with another algorithm. That's the definition of crypto agility. We should all do it because we're going to put new algorithms out there in the wild. They may not have been fully tested or the implementation may not be ready. You should be ready to swap. Make sure you have policy, engage with your vendors, make sure it's part of every buy choice you have with suppliers and start failing early. Thank you so much.